All right. Uh, so we've been covering uh, 1 Corinthians. Um, we did the first two chapters already. So if you remember last time we covered a little bit about the natural person and the spiritual person, some of the differences there, um, about the wisdom of this world versus the wisdom of Christ. And so today uh, we want to cover 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So feel free to turn with me there in your Bibles. And we'll just read through chapter 3 there first. Verse 1 says, But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it, and even now you are not yet ready. For you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, <clears throat> are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believe, as the Lord assigned to each. <coughs> Excuse me. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness and again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. So let no one boast in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours, and you are Christ, and Christ is God's. And so let's uh, go back to the beginning here and start at verse 1. <clears throat> and so the Apostle Paul, remember he is speaking to a, a church here um, that was known to be somewhat of a fleshly carnal church they weren't really a spirit-filled church they weren't striving or see, didn't seem like they were striving to live for god probably some people were but it sounded like many of them had become quite um quite fleshly minded um quite earthly minded might be another way that we would say that and so paul says here that he couldn't he couldn't address them as as spiritual people we might we might in our day we might say we couldn't really talk to them about the deep things of god because they they were immature they, they couldn't grasp it they were new in their faith or they they hadn't grown in their faith and so he says here that that they were people of the flesh in fact he goes as far as to say as infants in christ and then he talks a little bit about what an infant is he says an infant is one that you feed with milk, not solid food. And most of us know this to be true as, as, as we've had our own children. We, we know that we can't feed them table food. I have a little three-month-old baby right now, and, uh, and, it, and she knows her meal time. It seems like every time we sit down to eat, then she wants to eat. And, and we, but we can't give her the food from the table because she's too immature. Her palate, her, her, her stomach, her digestive system can't handle solid food. So she still has to 
um, eat milk. So when we eat our food at the table, she eats her own food, specially prepared. And so uh, it's just kind of every time I see that, it, it reminds me even of the scripture passage here, that, that as we give our lives over to Jesus, there ought to be development happening. There ought to be a maturing process happening. And so uh, one of the important things one of the, the tests that you can give yourself about your maturity level is what diet are you on? When you think about your life, what diet are you on? What are you, what are you feeding off of? Are you the kind of individual, and, and so we, we know people like this who, who the only spiritual nourishment they get on a weekly basis is what they receive on a Sunday morning. While it's good that people come out to church on a Sunday morning, it kind of demonstrates that their diet is very, very um, empty. Like they're starving themselves. They're not really nourishing themselves. They're not replenishing themselves sufficiently. And to do it sufficiently, as you mature in your faith, you want your diet to also increase. Just like as a child grows up, its diet increases. And so as a, as a Christian, as a believer your hunger, your development ought to increase as well as you grow. And if, and if you are still feeding off of the basics of Christianity, for example, like maybe, you, maybe you're, you're still really no further than the first year that you became a Christian. And maybe, maybe some of you look around at church and you see other people that became a Christian at the same time as you, and now all of a sudden you're seeing their leaps and bounds ahead of you. They're way beyond you, spiritually speaking. Maybe they're already serving in a position. Maybe God has called them to some kind of ministry already. And, and you think, well, I'm still stuck back here feeding on milk. And, and maybe you don't even want to think that way. But, but what is your diet like? What are you feeding on? What are you, what are you sustaining yourself on? Because if you're not sustaining yourself on the, the meat of the Word of God, then you are... Then, then you are a weak, malnourished um, Christian. And so he's encouraging you here um, to, to not be like that. He actually says here that they, as he speaks to them, they were not ready. They're still of the flesh. And then he demonstrates, here's some evidence that I see in your life which demonstrates you're still in the flesh. He says, there's jealousy among you. There's, there's strife. You're, you're fighting between the two uh, be, uh, like among you, you're, you're being babyish, you're being childish. You're, you're comparing yourselves among yourselves. You know, one of you says, I follow Paul. One of you says, I follow uh, um, Apollos. And he, he says here, this is, this is not fleshly. I mean, this is not spiritual. This is fleshly. This is, this is human. This is like the world does things. This is, this is like the, the kid on the playground who says, well, my dad's better than your dad. Or... Or, you know, my dad's stronger than your dad. And, and it's, it's immature. It's, it's, it's wrong. It's, it's babyish is what he's saying. It's like an infant. And, and he's, say, he's saying here, that kind of an attitude that's coming out um, demonstrates that you are uh, feeding off of a diet meant for an infant. And it ought not to be that way. Yeah, he's saying, even back in the first chapter, he was saying that I came and preached Christ crucified and nothing else. And he's saying here, the, like you're just saying, the evidence of you still being uh, babes in Christ is the fact that you are being childish, like trying to attach yourself to the person who you think maybe has the highest standing in society, maybe the person with the most status or something, because they want to be attached to whoever is most well known so that they themselves can also climb that ladder so that they will be looked at as somebody who is somebody. And yet, Paul is saying he came and didn't preach anything for himself. The only thing he came was to say, Christ crucified, and that's what he preached. Because this is what the message is about. This is not uh, Paulus, he came and watered, Paul planted, but they're all preaching the same message, and yet these people were missing the point. They're saying, well, you know, I think Paul's a better guy. Maybe he's more well-known, broader. I I'm going to follow him. And they're missing the point that Christ is what he was preaching. It wasn't himself. Yeah. And then they get into this childish thing where, hey, my dad is stronger than your dad. Mm -hmm. right? And they're having this little 
childish fight about who thinks who's better and who's stronger, and, and yet Paul is saying, no, 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 that's, that's, what pro- that's what proves that you're missing the point, that you're still needing milk. Yeah. Because in the next verse he says, what's Apollos and what's Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. He says, I planted Apollos water, but God gives the growth. He's saying the two of us don't matter as far as this growth thing goes. We were obedient to our, por- our part in the, in the grand scheme of things. He, I planted, he watered, he came, we did our jobs, and yet he goes, God is the one who gives the increase. That's who you need to attach yourself with. And when you get that, that spiritual growth in your, own, in your own selves, you will recognize that Christ crucified is what you need to attach to. Mm. Christ died. He gave himself up to be, to be killed so that, so that we could live. And when they get that, then that, that's what they should be attaching themselves to. But they're not there yet. They're still needing milk. Just, and, and then thinking that whoever they attach themselves to the, will, will bring them up higher in that rung or whatever. I'm not yeah. sure what, what their exact reason was there. But, but they weren't getting it yet that it was Christ whom they needed to attach themselves to. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit like, um, like if, if I was to say to, to you here, uh, you know, see my beautiful cup. And you came to me and you said, well, actually, my, my cup is a little, looks a little prettier than yours. And my, my, my cup's actually a little bit better. And, it's and I it's said, a little no, bit no, bigger. Look at mine. You know, my, my, you know, look at all the, mine was actually made in, in Canada. You know, it's made here. It's, it's designed perfectly. And all the while, we would be debating all this stuff here, but it would be what's inside the cup that counts. You know, it's not what's outside, right? And that's what he's saying here. He's saying, He's saying, we are insignificant. It's all about God. You know, it's, it's not about the outside. Yep. In uh, verse, verse 8 there, he says that every single one of us are going to receive our wages according to the way we labored. You know, God is going to, one day we're going to stand before the Lord and everything that we we did as a believer is going to be put to the test or to the flame, to the fire. And uh, he says, we, we will receive wages according to our labor. Not according to someone else's labor, not according to um, how, how we compared ourselves among ourselves. You know, it's, it's, it's going to be based on the things that we did, how we built and what we built with. And, and then I, I love what he says in verse 9. He says, we are God's fellow workers. He says, you are God's field, meaning that the church of Jesus Christ is, is the field. Um, and actually, in, in a sense, you could even say the, the world is the field because it's the world where, where the believers are taken out of, um, to some degree anyways. But we are the workers that are going around and we are ministering to people um, and, uh, and bringing salvation to them and sharing the good news with them and we are practicing um, our good deeds before them so they will give glory to God. Um, and then verse 10, he says, he says this. He says, he says, now Corinthians, I want you to look a little bit at my life. And so he says, this is what I did. Like a skilled master builder and, and he's not bragging about himself. In fact, you know, he was the same man that called himself the chief of sinners. But he said, God um, endowed him with skill. God endowed him with a gift and an ability. And so he says, with skill, he laid a foundation, a good foundation. And, and so this is a, a thought that we also need to consider is, what foundation are we laying? And upon what foundation are we building? You know, there's many people today that claim to to, to be following Jesus, but they're not building upon the right foundation. And here he says, I laid a foundation. And then he says this, someone else is building upon it. Um, let each one take care how he builds upon it. Uh, and, and just so you know, I, 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 I've, I, I, I really I think of this passage in a really sober-minded way because of the position that I've inherited here in the church. You know, I've, I've been serving as pastor here now for about five years, and, and I'm building upon a foundation that was laid by the previous pastor. And he built upon the foundation that was laid by the previous pastor. It, it, that's a, it's a really interesting thought when you think about it. And so some of the, the harvest 
that we've had here in the church is the fruit of someone else's ministry. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Years down the road when, when I'm gone, there will be fruit that will come out of the ministry that, that, that I gave here, Lord willing. And, and so he says here, every single one of us, though, is building. Like, like you as, as a young person, as a new believer, one day you're going to pass the torch on to your son and your daughter, and they're going to build upon the foundation that you laid. And so every single one of us needs to take care how we build upon that foundation. What, what's our motivation? Why are we doing these things? Like, like what is our purpose in these things? Are we doing these things so that people will, will observe our works? Is that our motive? Are we, are, we, are we doing good deeds for the kingdom of God so that men will praise us? Are we doing good deeds because we genuinely love Jesus and we want to see his kingdom advance in a world that is so hopeless? Uh, like, like what, is, what is our driving motivation in life? What, what is really there? What, what brings us out to prayer meeting? What brings us out to church? What brings us out to serve the Lord? Like, why would we give someone a gospel tract and say, hey, have you heard of Jesus? Why would we do any of those things? Is it so that others would s see that? Is it so we would fulfill a certain quota that we have every day? You know, these are all things that we need to ask ourselves so that we understand how we are building upon this foundation. Yeah, I'm kind of thinking of, of uh, you know, when you go back to Houghton Center before our time, before Pastor Henry was pastor, there was Pastor Ham, right? And he was building on Christ crucified. Hmm. So I, I don't know a whole lot of details about the individual, but I just know that, that he, was, he was a born-again believer that was preaching the truth from the Word of God. And... And when he was ready to leave, the whole church said, oh no, what's going to happen now? Mm -hmm. Our pastor's leaving. And yet God had already raised up somebody that was going to take over for him. And maybe, maybe there was a few individuals that had attached themselves to that pastor, and may, they may have left the church at that point when he left. Uh, I'm not sure about that, but, but you hear this often. And then when Henry was, was leading the church for like 20 years, thereabouts? Yeah, just about. Yeah. So... And then the same thing happened. The church was doing well, and he was preaching Christ crucified and, and, and being obedient to his calling. And then when they were going to leave to go to Mexico, there were some people that were saying, oh, no, what's going to happen to Lighthouse? Oh, no, our, our shepherd is leaving. Like, no, if you're building on, if you're attaching yourself to Henry, then our church would have crumbled. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't the pastor that we were attaching ourselves to. It's the Word of God, the Christ crucified. And that's kind of what he's saying here. Like, be careful how you build on this. If you're going to lead a group of people, if you're going to go preach the Word on the street, where, wherever you're going, if it's going to be anything other than Christ crucified, you have a very, very shaky foundation. It has to be Christ crucified, and it can't be about you. Yep. Right? And I think that when I look back at those things, and I see that 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 Mr. Ham built on Christ, Henry did, and you are. So there's, there's solid building on solid foundations where, where the church can come and get fed because they're hearing the Word of God, not saying, look at me, who I am and what I can do, mm -hmm. but we're basing it on the Word of God. And I think that's when the church can grow and thrive, even if there's chaotic times uh, for it. But, but even when the day comes when you're gone, if the church has, uh, as a whole has built their foundation on Christ crucified, it can continue to thrive mm -hmm. Yep. And, and like Paul is saying here, like, mm. as, in, as insignificant as he is, so are we. His church will be built by God and not by us. Amen. And I think that's what Paul is trying to get to here. Like This foundation is so incredibly criti cri critical that if there's any other foundation that is being laid other than Christ, it's going to be in, in huge uh, trouble there, probably crumbling. Mm -hmm. right? It's not going to stand the test of time. Yeah, and then he says not only that, but how you how you actually build on top of that foundation is what's a big deal. And he gives some pretty cool illustrations there, that if you take time to kind of research it, like he's saying that if it, now if anyone builds on it, gold, silver, precious stones, those are three good things, and then wood, wood, hay, and straw, those are three things that that will burn up when it Flammable. gets put to the test, right? Yeah. Like when you're thinking of the mm -hmm. of the idea of of gold and silver and precious stone, these are three. Uh, commodities that are hard to come by. They're not just laying around anywhere that you can use. You normally have to dig in for them 
to be able to find it, even to, to, to build on top of this. So, like, when you're relating that to the Word of God, it's not like you're not just reading over a text and you're saying, okay, I did my duty for the day, and you, work, you walk on. You actually dig into Scripture. You say, what is God saying in this, right? Like, to me personally. Yeah, yeah. What, what, what is He t- telling me here? Not just saying, well, He says, what's strong? Uh, okay, well, I read that part, now I'm good to go. I did my, my duty for the day. But when you're digging in, because gold, silver, and precious stone, they're not just laying around. It requires hard work. Yeah. You know, and, and the, the life of a Christian, when, you're, when you want to get grounded, when you want to get to the meat and potatoes, it's work. It's not like you're taking a sip of milk and you're on your way again. Nobody else prepares it for you. A little bottle, you shake it up and you drink it. Like that's when you're, when, you're, when you're moving past the infant stage of Christianity, then you're, you start eating meat and potatoes. You start digging in yourself and feeding yourself, right? Yeah. You know, it, it, it actually kind of reminds me, and you and I have had this discussion before, of, uh, of the, the Christian that comes to church on a Sunday morning, and he says, or she says, he or she, you know, nobody talks to me. Nobody invites me over. Nobody pays any attention to me. I, I don't know why nobody loves me. Nobody, nobody does anything for me. Why aren't they helping me? Why aren't they looking after me? And, and instead of someone coming to church and saying, you know, I'm going to see how I can serve the Lord today. It's a whole different um, attitude. It, you know, somebody who comes here and says, it doesn't matter what other people do for me. I'm going to go to church today to serve other people and be like Christ. It's, it's just a different way of looking at things. And, and it kind of separates the, the one who is building, um, I think, with gold, silver, and precious stones. Like it's, you're talking about this hard work versus somebody who's just, ah, you know, whatever, and do whatever without, with, uh, with whatever motivation, right? It kind of, kind of reminds me a little bit of that. You know, like one of the presidents in the U.S. quoted, and I'm not even sure which one it was now offhand, but don't ask what the country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. It kind of applies to the church. Don't come to church saying, I want to see what they can all do for me. I have here, I have some needs. Let's see what they can do, mm-hmm. rather than coming and saying, because if you, if you wake up in the morning and say, God, put somebody in my path today that I can be a blessing to, he will. Mm-hmm. There's always somebody less fortunate than you. There's always somebody who has a need that you can help fulfill. And there's always, there's always something you can do to be a blessing rather than saying, man, who is going to come and help me today? Well, I think there's a reason why Jesus said it is more, it's a bigger blessing to give than it is to receive. Because mm-hmm. as you are blessing somebody else, you are being fulfilled. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden you have this purpose and meaning in life and you, your problems all of a sudden seem a whole lot smaller than they did before. Yeah, it t- actually can pull you out of depression. And, and give you reason for, for living. Um, notice there he says that everyone's work um, will be tested by fire. Like, like, it, like, like nobody's going to be able to say, oh, well, you know, God's not going to test my work or, or have that thought in your mind. Like every single one of our, our actions here on the earth, he says, uh, as a Christian, this is there's nothing, notice that this is not a, a salvation topic here. But it's a works topic that follows salvation. And so after salvation, we're going to serve the Lord with various different things. And um, if you remember Matthew chapter 25, Jesus gave some really practical ways on how we can serve him. And he said, he said you know, uh, I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and in prison and you visited me. And, and he says, I was... Um, ah, I lost my train of thought here. But anyways... Uh, um, that, that, that whole scripture passage there, he, he tells the people how they ministered to him. And then he says, as much as you've done it to the least of these people, you've done it to me. And then, and then in that passage, he separates the sheep from the goats. And he says, he says to those who, who didn't consider these practical things of ministering and doing works for the kingdom of God, he he says to them, depart from me, you cursed into everlasting hellfire, prepared for the devil and his angels. He says, because I never knew you. I, I didn't know you. I didn't. Your, your works were not done for the kingdom of heaven. And, and so he, he says, he, in that passage, he says, um, he, he's basically, he's, he's saying here, if you want to see a practical way of how to do some good works, 
He says, visit the sick and those who are in prison. Minister to the, the lonely and the desperate and the, and, the, and the weak. Have compassion like Jesus did. You know, where he left the 99 and went out to find the one lost sheep out in the mountains. You know, be that kind of a person. Be the kind of person that when you see somebody that has needs, you go and clothe them. You go and bless them. You provide food for those who are hungry. You know, all of these kinds of, these are just very practical ways. But, but it, it, it demonstrates to us that, that he wants us to be involved in doing things for the kingdom of God. And, and so he says that, that at the end of the ages, the fire is going to test the work. And, and he says there that if anyone's work is burned up, in verse 15, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. That's an interesting thought, right? So he, he gives the thought here that there may be people that will inherit eternal life with very little works or almost nothing to show for. It doesn't mean that they didn't get salvation. It doesn't mean that Jesus didn't rescue them and give them eternal life. It just meant that, that they lived the rest of their life, their Christian life, uh, selfishly and carnally, like these people were doing here in the uh, Corinthian church. They were feeding off of milk. They were, they were living as infants. And, and this is ought not to be the way we live our lives. Yeah, if you want to be building on that foundation properly, that it's not going to be wood or straw or hay that burns up, then seek to serve the next person. Because it, even in Matthew chapter 7, uh, Jesus says, not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, will enter, but those that do the will of the Father. Yeah. Right? And he says that, uh, kind of like what Paul is saying here, like there's, these guys are saying, well, when did we not do many great things in your name? Did we not do this and that and the other? They're still kind of doing what Paul is trying to get these Corinthians away from. They're attaching themselves to trying to build a reputation. They're, they want to be known. They want to be seen. They want to leave this legacy that they were somebody. And, and if, you are, if you're going to build with all this precious stuff, they're going to be like Paul. He's gonna, he comes and says, you know what? If somebody says, why, why did you just come and help me with this? Because Jesus would have done it. Yeah. Not because I'm a good person and I have compassion on you, but Jesus would have done it, and I am like, I am, I'm, I'm trying to imitate Jesus, so what he would have done is what I'm trying to do, so glory to him, right? Then you're not building yourself, then you're lifting up the name of Jesus in the, in the process, so there's very simple things that you can do in that, like you're already sharing, like giving, giving somebody food, like when you're, when you're helping them if, they're, if they need clothing, whatever it may be, but you're, you're helping them because Christ would have done the same. And then you're not building on straw or wood or hay. Yeah. Yeah, just a, a few more thoughts here yet as we wrap up this chapter. Um, I don't know how many of you ever stop and meditate on verse 16 and 17 there. Um, you know, from time to time, people will, I'll get into conversation with people and they'll, they'll be of the, the mindset that, you know, everything about the Christian life is spiritual. There's nothing physical. In this in these couple of verses here, though, it demonstrates something a little bit different, that, that the physical is very much a part of the spiritual. And he, so he says this, he says, your, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Your body is, the, is the, the place where the Spirit of God resides. And, and so he says this, um, that if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. And, and I just think, I just wanted to share just a few little thoughts about it. I just think this should give us a little bit of pause to even consider how we treat our own bodies. You know, sometimes we talk about um, the, the issues with, with alcohol addiction, drug addiction, and cigarette addiction, and maybe we don't give it a whole lot of thought. But, and, and it's not even just that. How about, how about, um, how about eating wrong foods? junk foods and, and, and these kind, not, not eating the right kind of foods, is that really any worse than someone who smokes cigarettes? Somebody who, who destroys their body with the kind of foods that they eat or the kind of um, drinks, you know, I, I think even, uh, it don't take me wrong here, but I think even of some of these energy drinks, you know, I'm, I'm not uh, preaching against energy drinks per se, 
except for the fact that should we not consider a little bit more carefully sometimes the kind of food and drink that we put into our physical bodies, knowing that, that we are the dwelling place of the Spirit of God? And, and I just I, I thought of that today as I was reading this and just thinking, if we destroy God's temple, God will allow it. In a sense, he's saying God will destroy him. If we, if we corrupt ourselves with, with all of these contaminants and, and these things that, that end up destroying us, um, and we end up living a shortened lifespan, I, I really think one day we'll stand before the Lord and, and God will say to us, you know, I had, I had a lot of things prepared for you and planned for you, but you destroyed your body with substance abuse. You destroyed your body with all these contaminating things that, that inside your mind you had a guilty conscience. You knew these things were not healthy for you. You knew these things were not helping you. And, and he says here, remember that God's temple is holy. And he says, you are that temple. And so when we consider those things, we ought to remember that, that God's temple is holy. That means us. That means the things that we take in physically, the things that we watch with our eyes, all of those things, are they contaminating us? Are they destroying this temple? Yeah, I think that's an incredible statement there in that verse. Yeah. That God will destroy anybody who destroys God's temple. And he goes, oh, because God's temple is holy. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want to, be, want to make any mistake or have anybody think wrongly of it here. God's temple is holy. And he goes, and you are that temple. You are that holy temple of God. I think sometimes we take it so for granted, like you were just sharing some of those, uh, those abuses that we often take part in, like whether it's uh, gluttony or, or whatever it may be, if it's a different kind of addiction. But, but we abuse the temple, the holy temple of God, mm. willingly by the things that we're doing. And I think if we can, if we can stop it for a moment, just try to comprehend what that means, that we are that holy temple of God, I think we might start making a few different life choices, right? Like, where we would probably honor God's workmanship a little bit more. Yeah. Rather than, than getting sick down the road and thinking, well, now, now what? How, how am I going to find help now? And, and not saying every sickness that comes your way is a direct result of that. Sometimes there's things that come up that, that you don't have control That's over. Right. But, yeah. mm -hmm. but very often, it's because of the prolonged use of something. A lifestyle or, or carelessness yeah. even or something, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and so he, he um, if we look at the rest of the passage there, he says, let no one deceive himself. Anyone among you who thinks he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that, that he might actually become wise in the things of the Lord. Because the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. The, the philosophers of this age, the the professors of this age who, who, would, who would try to convince you that their way of thinking is right, um, you know, whether it's evolutionary-based or, or whatever it is. The, the, the wisdom of this world, he says, um, and the direction that this world is going in is futile. When you think of the word futile, the, one of the, the greatest uh, ways that I can think of it is going nowhere. It's futile. It's going nowhere. It's not, it's hitting a dead end. And he says that's, that's what God calls the thoughts of, of the wise of the world. Um, the, the, the direction they're going, it's futile. So he says because of that, don't boast in men. Don't, don't become like them. And, he, and he's, he's going back to this thought that these Corinthian people had where they, where they were trying to follow after a man, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, don't boast in men. Don't boast in the cup. It's what's inside that counts. You know, stop focusing on, on the outward, on the, on the vessel. Um, he says it's what's inside that counts. You are Christ and Christ is God's. You had any other thoughts there, Pete? Nope. Yeah, so may God give us wisdom to, 
to see what he values. May, you know, may we value what he values. And, uh, and may God give us wisdom to not lean on, on man's temporary, foolish philosophies. Close in prayer. Mm. Yep. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you at the end of this chapter. We want to give you thanks, Lord, for having, having given us the word through many different writers that were inspired by your Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for that because we can see again and again what is important. Even as Paul was trying to teach these Corinthians here about the importance of attaching themselves to Christ crucified, not anybody that would come and speak to them, but that they would have the proper view of God and that they would build on the proper foundation, even building on it properly. Lord, I thank you for, for the teachings in this chapter. Would you help us to apply it to our lives personally so that we would be able to grow in our faith, that we would get away from being hungry for milk and actually learn how to eat ourselves by feeding ourselves with your word. Father, I pray this for each one that we would that we would have a hunger and a desire for righteousness and for your word and that we would that we would take it and consume it and grow spiritually from that. So Lord, I thank you for each one that came and pray that you would bless us even as we leave from here. In Jesus' name. Amen.